announcement. Why don't you give a little mouthful of food chewed up? Please raise your hand. Seth? On uh, February 12th, Wilson Bacon Trust will be hosting our annual farmer's luncheon. Uh, typically, we will have our farmer's luncheon the Wednesday after President's Day, but this year we had to move it back because we have a very special guest coming to speak to us. It's the Commissioner of Agriculture, uh, Charlie Hatcher, is coming to speak. So if you're interested in coming to that, we're going to get some invitations out to add the newspaper and all that good stuff. But we need everybody to RSVP if you're planning to be there on February 12th at 1130 upstairs in the community. Okay. I have three things. Well, let's see if I can get these right now. I'm trying to get them in order. The, uh, the baseball team is having a fundraiser. They're having a reverse raffle for $1,000. Uh, I have think she sent you some information. They're going to be yeah. giving away some more stuff. That's on the 31st. Tickets to the Chili Supper, $5. Right. For British raffle tickets are 20 Yes. From baseball players or Allison Barton. So that's on the 31st. Yes. That raffle. Uh, February the 8th, the basketball team's having the alumni basketball games. 6 o'clock that night. And the Rotary Club is having their father daughter dance on the 15th at the high school. Okay. And if you are of the age, you have daughters, fathers, if you need to go to that dance, be sure to buy your tickets early because there's a limited number of tickets and then you sell out. It's a great event. To, where do you buy the tickets for the father daughter dance? Rotary members? Either bank. Either bank. Okay. Rotary members are either bank. Okay. John. Well, I had the order forms of these books uh, at our last meeting, the December to our first volume of the two volume history of Chasley County, celebrating the 150th anniversary, uh, has come in. And so if you ordered one and have not picked it up yet, I have a few extra in the car. But if you want to go ahead and place an order today, the second book will be out in about a month. And we are very fortunate that we are going to have one of those as our door prize today. Woo! So, big door prize. Um, do we have any other community announcements? Yep. Okay, I have a couple. February 20th, so Monday evening at 6 o'clock, we are going to have a meeting in the downstairs at the courthouse on the City Guide Business Directory. We, it's Martin Luther King Day, but we're going to go ahead and have the meeting in the evening anyway. We are working on getting the photo contest ready. We're going to have a photo contest for the front and the back cover of that publication. It will feature short articles about um, events and highlights in Charlesdale County, plus it will have the full business directory, and it will be available free in gas stations, etc., around the community. So we're hoping to promote Charlesdale County a little bit, and beautiful photos are one of the things we're really great at. And at 7 p.m., we're going to have the community improvement meeting. We are still working on finding unique and non-expensive ways to get people to improve their properties and clean up. So if you'd like to be part of either of those events, just come and join us. There's no special thing. Just come and be part of the group, and we welcome all your ideas. Yes? What day was the community improvement? The 20th, Monday night. City guides at 6, and community improvements at 7. Okay, anything else? If not, we will welcome Warden Russell Washburn. And I have to say that so slowly, because it's like a tongue twister if you try it fast. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, I learned last time from this group to try to keep my uh, talking points as so minimal because I know last time we had a lot of questions and uh, <clears throat> I've seen the hey, we need to cut it off. So I'll try to keep my comments brief and so that we can keep on schedule. But, uh, for those that have not met uh, Russell Washburn, I'm the warden at uh, the facility here in Trousdale County, which is Trousdale Turner Correctional Center. Uh, we house uh, up to uh, the actual bed capacity is uh, 2672. Uh, our max capacity as far as contract is 2,552. We've been averaging about 2,500 uh, here as of late. And that's primarily the push from the state uh, is trying to help keep all of the uh, beds filled across the state to uh, lessen the burden and the impact to the county jails. 
uh, I forget what it, the, the number is, but it's pretty alarming with the amount of state Senate inmates today across the state that are not currently in a state facility. They're still residing in a county jail. And as the sheriff knows, that creates uh, a burden uh, on the on those jails because they, uh, quite frankly, most of them are at capacity or above capacity. So uh, the state's taken a very strong stance of keeping all those beds filled. One of the challenges across the state is those annex beds. And the annex beds are the offenders who go out into the community and do various work details. But uh, with budget constraints and things that uh, the counties are doing today uh, and the state is doing, is that they're looking at uh, ty different types of sentencing structures to keep people out of prison uh, as opposed to putting them into prison. And, and that's a great thing for those nonviolent uh, type of offenders. But what that does is the ones that are incarcerated are those who truly need to be behind a fence and behind bars and behind uh, concrete and steel. So that impacts those annex beds. And I hear that quite a bit, is why don't we see more offenders out in the community working on the side of the road? Uh, well, that's part of it. Because again, as they figure out alternate uh, means to keeping people out of prison, again, the ones that need to be there typically are your more violent offenders who uh, necessarily, I'm not gonna put my signature on to put them out into the community. Uh, to where they have the opportunity to victimize other people. So uh, that's where we're at. As far as staffing, uh, I will tell you, um, it's not unique to Trousdale Turner. Uh, it's not unique to Tennessee, but we continue to, be, to struggle with, with the staffing complement at uh, the facility. So if any of you have anybody who's interested in coming to work, uh, please uh, send them my way. Uh, again, uh, I can't employ felons, uh, so don't send anybody there that's got a felony background. Uh, we can employ some misdemeanors, uh, depending on the type of misdemeanor, uh, uh, but uh, certainly if you have anybody, and, and I'll also say this, is that we don't just employ correctional officers. We have teachers, we have uh, principals, we have administrators, and administrative type roles. Uh, so if you can think about it uh, in the free world, it probably exists uh, there at that facility. So don't just pigeonhole that and say, well, I don't know anybody who wants to be a correctional officer today, so there's probably not an opportunity for them for employment there. So on, the, on your tables, I didn't have enough, I apologize. Um, I'm certain this big group wasn't for me, but uh, I did not make enough copies to go out. But this is just some facts and uh, information about the facility. But I do want to talk about a program that we have recently uh, started at the facility, which has been great for the offenders, and it's also a program uh, that can uh, that the inmate can get employment upon release and that's how we try to stage all of our uh, programs and services because it doesn't make any sense for us to have a vocational trade or teach a, a, an offender a trade if it's not a market out there once they get released. If they want to employ uh, felons, there's no sense in us teaching that person because it's not a whole lot of value. So we have uh, worked with the Tennessee Department of Corrections and Persevere, which is the name of the group that we're using, and they have actually brought computers into the facility and they're teaching our offenders to be computer coding uh, analysts. So they're actually writing codes for various types of programs that you would see on your computers today. Uh, and so there's a big market. Uh, the average pay for that is about $25 start out pay. Uh, so that's a, a good wage, especially for a uh, felon offender. <coughs> Uh, so right now we have 25 that are in that class. We're looking to expand that to 50 uh, here in the near future. Uh, but again, any program that we can put in place that allows an offender to get out into the community and ultimately not return to the facility is a good expense, in my opinion, for the taxpayer dollars because it doesn't make any difference. Uh, it doesn't do it. There's no value of us just warehousing people. And, and I, I hear this a lot as, well, sure, that for-profit organization uh, is in tune and wanting to reduce recidivism. But I'll say this, and our CEO really hit this nail on the head, is that how many systems across the United States today have an issue with incarceration? How many, how many different states, local entities, are challenged and plagued in their budgets because of the correctional uh, environment? I would argue that every one of them, every one of them, and that is one of the largest expenses to any state, or county, or federal government. So if we, meaning Core Civic, can come up with a mechanism that allows a significant reduction in that, recid or in that recidivism rate, where we're not, we're not seeing as many people come back into incarceration, that is a good uh, opportunity for us to go out and solicit new business. Because guess what, if we know how to do it and we're doing it well, 
I would think that another government agency would want us into, uh, to partner with them to help them with their uh, issues with, or as far as budgets and their inflating uh, population. So that's really kind of our platform, business platform, although it does sound kind of opposite, is why would that for-profit organization want to see fewer inmates? Well, there's one thing I can tell you, it's kind of like healthcare. The need to incarcerate people is never going to go away, ever. So there's some job security in that. But uh, ultimately, if we can deliver on a meaningful service, then, then that's what we want to do. The other thing I also like to say is Trousdale, uh, we're committed to the community. And any way thing that we can do to help in the community, we want to be that partner. Uh, I, I tell you, we had the opportunity over the Christmas holiday to go in and provide gifts to every resident at all three of the uh, assistant living homes here in Trousdale County, uh, which was huge. I can tell you, many of those folks uh, don't have visitors or their families. Uh, may not necessarily get to see them as frequently as, as you'd like. Uh, so uh, those are the types of things that we're doing in the community to make a footprint and to, so, to show folks that we're not just about warehousing people. We're not just about negativity. Uh, we're about being a, a meaningful partner to uh, Trousdale County and to all the residents of Trousdale County. So just quickly running through, if you see kind of the programs that we offer uh, here, I asked a lot of questions about uh, the different programs that we offer. So I wanted to make sure we, that this group got that information. Uh, anything really in the school system uh, that exists, exists at our facility. One of the unique facts that uh, if, I think probably most everybody knows Mr. Kerr, and, and uh, he was our former principal when I first arrived. Uh, I'm not sure how they negotiated this, but uh, all of the uh, inmates who are successful in achieving their high school equivalency at Trousdale impacts the numbers of Trousdale County in a positive way. Now the unsuccessful ones don't have any impact whatsoever. So I'm not sure who worked out that deal or how they got that accomplished, but it was a great win for Trousdale County to, to be a part of that. But, um, you know, cause I know that the, the numbers have an impact to uh, a lot of things here in the community. Uh, and of course the uh, tax revenue is a huge benefit to the county, although it has some, some I think some unintended consequences as it relates to education dollars in the, in the past. but. For those who don't know, our average tax is about 1.5 million annually uh, as, a as our tax base uh, to Trousdale County, which is obviously doing great things here in the county uh, and, and has assisted with many things that maybe were not able to be performed in the past. So that's really just kind of where we're at as far as the facility. So staffing, uh, if you know of anybody, nursing and medical or security staff or anybody outside of that, please refer them to me and we'll be more than happy to uh, talk to them and, and hopefully get them to be able to join the team. But I do want to leave plenty of time for questions because, again, this last time this group really peppered me with questions and had to cut it off. So, yes, ma'am. You were talking about uh, taking gifts to all of the uh, nursing homes and all. Do you have inmates that you can actually? allowed to go out or is it just employees? No, just employees. Now one of the things that uh, we did not do this year, we purchased all the items that uh, we were able to provide to the residents. Uh, but one of the things we want to incorporate is a, like a crochet program uh, to where we have offenders crocheting lap blankets and various uh, hats and things, those types of things uh, so that they can give back to some of the, the people that maybe they have victimized in the past. And this was is equally rewarding to them too. But no, only staff go out and deliver those types of items. So, yes, ma'am. Do you have an idea of what the national average is for recidivism and how that works for you? Are you low in returns? Well, it, it's, it's really a hard number uh, to, to really just draw to. And I know that many states have recidivism rates and facilities have that. But I will tell you that they're very, very difficult. I don't know that there's any one organization out there that has just figured out the, the proper process for tracking. And I'll say that to say this because you know, the state can really, if you release an offender, that's easy. That's in a database, you can see that. And if that offender reoffends here in the state of Tennessee, they're gonna see them come back into their system and so therefore they equate into their numbers. They may not necessarily see that if that person goes to another state or if they go in and get arrested at a county jail, uh, that information may not necessarily make it back that this person has reoffended. Uh, it's really only those who release within the same system and come back in the same system because uh, you can think about that threshold that it would take in order to track a single person and every single incarceration that they may have. I'll tell you, State of Tennessee does pretty well uh, based off of the numbers, but I don't know how I don't know how much faith I would put into the number as far as qualifying. It's really just those released in Tennessee and then reoffended in Tennessee and came back in the same system. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
I hope that answers the questions kind of all the way around it. Yes, ma'am. Do you have the dog training program? We do not yet, but we are in the process of working towards uh, getting a dog program. And I tell you, uh, since I've been a warden, uh, I've been in corrections for just over 25 years, and, uh, and so I've seen a lot of dog programs. The one I'm probably the most uh, inclined is the uh, Auburn University uh, program, which we take uh, labs and we start their initial training for bomb sniffing uh, type of uh, animals. And at my previous facility, many of those actually, once they uh, made it successful for the first stage, they go back to Auburn University, they finish out their remaining training, because obviously we're not gonna allow explosives and things of that nature uh, inside of the facility uh, for them to start detecting. But many of those uh, are actually go to the military. And so they're serving in the U.S. military uh, as, as bomb sniffing dogs or in uh, law enforcement agencies and things of that nature. The other one that I liked is a uh, is the campaign or, or the ones that we're teaching um, to be a service animal, yes. to provide uh, whether it's opening a, a door, uh, retrieving a telephone, uh, turning on a light switch, and those are typically for uh, handicapped uh, individuals or children with uh, handicaps. That uh, so that, those are both really rewarding. But I've been involved in all of them. <coughs> been in ones where we took them right out of the humane shell, uh, humane society. Brought them, did obedience training, and made them a little bit more presentable for adoption. So, but yes, we're actively looking at the program, but we don't have one today. Yes, sir. I have a question. Yes, sir. Now, let's give it. You made. I've got a problem with our roadsides and all being messy, and our tax dollars paying for inmates to be sitting on jail, right? Yes, sir. Watching TV and everything else. Okay. And you made a statement about the you're trying to make the facility more for hardened criminals. And it's kind of hard to get them out and do a cleanup. Yes, sir. I was born and raised in Texas, and I remember as a boy, we had shotguns, horses, chains, and weed slings. The old chain gangs. Okay? Yeah. And guys didn't escape. They were hardened criminals. They didn't escape. And boy, they kept the roadsides clean out there in the country. You know? And so why we can't do that today? Why should we just be paying for them to just sit there and number one, they're just going to sit there. They should be doing something to just keep active, right? Correct. But number two, why should they be sitting there paying for cable, air conditioning, and, uh, and three squares a day and then just sitting around? I just don't understand. Yeah, and it's a legitimate argument. But and, if they, and if they are hard criminals, so they got long-term time to do it, we're going to be paying a whole lot of money as taxpayers to house these people. For a long time. For a long time, yes. so they should be doing something to help the community. That's my opinion. Yeah, and, and I would tell you, I mean, uh, unfortunately, uh, bad things have happened <laughs> in the past, and things, laws change and processes change. Uh, out in Texas, they used to allow inmates to actually guard other inmates with guns and give them keys. Uh, so I, I don't know that you get anybody to advocate for that today. Uh, <coughs> I, I would tell you, there's always there's a difference in belief in who should be and who should not be, and, and unfortunately, with lawsuits and things of that nature that have occurred. Those limitations to who can go outside the fence versus who cannot have all continued to strengthen each and every year. I think you can make a legitimate <clears throat> argument either way. I, I agree with you. Uh, an offender shouldn't be doing something, whether that's an education to better themselves so that when they get out, that they can be productive when they return <coughs> to society or working. There shouldn't be an offender. And I will tell you that our unemployment rate uh, at Trousdale averages less than 2%. Every offender uh, at our facility has some type of job assignment uh, whether that's in education or whether that's in an actual physical job. And one of the things the state of Tennessee, I think, does well uh, is the fact that they pay an offender for going to school. And I will tell you, I've been in systems to where we didn't pay offenders to go to school, and we only paid them to work. And so you have a person who doesn't have a high school diploma, and you say, hey, you can go work in the kitchen, and you're going to make X amount of dollars per week or you go to school and get the education that's gonna be meaningful you, for you for when you get out. More often than not, what offenders were doing was choosing that immediate because they didn't have family or somebody to help augment and give them money. So they would forgo the education and go to work. And the state of Tennessee doesn't have to do that. They're gonna get paid to go to school, they're gonna get paid to work on a detail on a program. And again, it's a, you can argue one way or the other uh, on whether or not that's the right thing to do. Uh, but I'm, a, I'm, I'm absolutely can stand in front of you today and say, if we don't do something different with that offender that's in our uh, care, I guarantee you they're coming back to prison. I guarantee it. Because we put them out the same way that we receive them. If we don't treat their drug issues, we don't treat their mental health issues, we don't give them opportunity to 
improve their education, they're coming back to the prison, and that's only going to be a burden on the taxpayer. So I agree with you as far as we, we need to be doing more, uh, but the unfortunate side is that we're governed by laws of what who can and cannot go outside of our fences. Hi. Yes, sir. You were talking about earlier that um, if you have an offender get out and they reoffend in, in another state, you don't have some kind of a national <clears throat> database system to track them to say, hey, you know, Joe over here got caught doing something crazy and he's back in jail in Mesa, Arizona or something. You can see it in Tennessee. A lot of the states do because they're large enough to have that infrastructure. It's typically your smaller rural county jails. Uh, that a lot of times still doing things paper process. Uh, I mean, I, if you think about it, with the state of Tennessee, uh, you would think with this day and age that nothing is done paper processed any longer. I will tell you, the entire state of Tennessee, medical files are still paper today. That is crazy. I mean, I have offenders who've been in our uh, custody, or the state of Tennessee's custody for over 30 years and have volumes of medical charts that we have to physically cart with them anytime that they move around this facility. And then say, hey, don't ever forget one. Make sure that that piece of paper gets into one of those 11 volumes uh, in the right order that it's supposed to be in. Uh, so that, that's the challenge is that, uh, yes, there is federal uh, grants and there's federal tax dollars and there's federal agencies that track recidivism rates. But it's the old adage, is trash in is trash out. It's only as good as the information that's being fed into that system to be able to make sure that those numbers are accurate. I mean, I think they're relatively close, but I would never hang my hat on to say that they're an absolute. Well, I know that, you know, with your, with your state facilities, as far as if, if you got a ticket in California, the state of Tennessee could look up and see that you got a ticket in California through a database Absolutely. system. Yeah, it's Why didn't. couldn't you do that same, same style system with inmates to say, okay, well, he's wanted over here, and we've, we've got him over here, he's offended him. And you just type in a number, and it's a simple website, and any, if they have one computer, they can access that information and say, okay, this is where he is, let's go get it. Why, it's that, the state knows that with your driver's license, points sure. and your tickets, why couldn't you do that with your inmates? It'd be the same thing, it's simple. You, you can, as long as all that data is in there. It, it get, but it, it, I will tell you, there's county jails out there today, their warrants are in a file cabinet, and they're maintained through that process and that they may or may not get put into that system until the actual warrant's served. Couldn't they hire another yeah. or something yeah. specific to require them to, to enter that data and make it mandatory by law that it has to be entered? But it, it would have to be a national law because each state or each county <coughs> could adopt their own uh, process without some type of federal mandate that says that all in, how correctional agencies will track in this way. That's, that's the only way you're going to be able to accomplish that. And even, even in that. What do you have to do to get something federally mandated? You have to go through the legislative bodies and, 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 and put a bill or put a law in place for it to be voted on. But be mindful, all of those things come with dollars you know, and, and budgets to be able to support that infrastructure to be able to do that. I was just thinking you've got prisoners learning computer coding and stuff. Yeah. You're training these guys. Why not make the prisoners? You know, require the prisoners to enter and set up this system. Make it, make them do it. They're learning computer coding technology. Yeah, when, when I say they're computer, they're not on the internet because uh, there's a, there's certainly a risk for, for putting inmates on the internet for potentially victimizing people or running their criminal enterprises through that process. Sure. This is a computer coding class that is on a standalone type computer process that's right. put it on this. Yeah, yeah, internet. Not to say that there are things and programs out there where inmates and offenders are on the internet. But it's not, they can't just go out and get on any access in any site. I don't know that any state or federal or local agency is going to allow an offender access to their systems uh, without, obviously, uh, a lot of red tape being cut through. Sure. Yep. Yes, ma'am. So can you talk a little bit about how visitation works? Yes. Uh, so visitation uh, at, at our facility, for the state facilities, it's actually only ran two days a week, and that's Saturday and Sunday. Uh, but for our facility, we actually run it four days a week. We run evening visitation on Monday, and we run evening visitation on Wednesday, uh, and then we run visitation two separate sessions, both Saturday and Sunday as well. We do that one for the size of our facility uh, to allow 2,500 plus uh, offenders the opportunity to visit. Uh, the, the inmate has to uh, put the individuals that they're requesting to be on their visitation list. Those visitors have to be uh, vetted and actually a background to train on them. And I will tell you, any type of rule violation that occurs in the facility, uh, they're going to receive some level of suspension on their ability to visit, up to include permanent uh, loss of visitation privileges. 
Example, if somebody gets caught bringing in or trying to introduce drugs into our facility, well, first and foremost, the sheriff over there is gonna give them a shiny new set of bracelets uh, and bring them down to the jail and, and criminally charge them. But we're gonna also ban them from ever coming back inside of the facility and potentially putting the staff and the other offenders at risk uh, for doing that. So uh, the staff are really, we go through that full process every day. Uh, if you haven't been out to the facility, I will tell you, it's much like going to the airport. You gotta clear security and you gotta be patted down and you've gotta do all those things to get inside the facility. The unfortunate side is sometimes without, I know everybody just ate, so I'll try not to be as graphic as possible. Uh, but the, there, if there's a will, there's a way, and sometimes people put contraband in areas that we can't necessarily search, so I'll let your mind wander there for a second. Uh, but, you know, the staff have done an excellent job. As that Obviously, that's got to come uh, out at some point and be turned over to the offender. So we reverse the process for the offender prior to leaving. And so they're fully searched uh, to include a strip search prior to them going back out into the compound. And we've uh, just put it in a new process to where the visitor has to stay in the visitation gallery until that search is completed. And that way we have the individual there if we find or discover some kind of contraband on that person. Uh, because ultimately if we let them go and then we find the contraband, of course we hold the inmate accountable, but we already, if the person's already gone and we can't hold them accountable as much as we should. And I, that's also, I'll put a little burden on the Sheriff's Department because they, they're having to pull deputies off the street uh, they're having to put people inside of their jail that are from outside of the county because they're committing uh, infractions there. So uh, we try to be cognizant of that and we're only going to really call if it's absolute uh, criminal violation that needs to be prosecuted. Hope that answered that. Yeah. Does the Saturday and Sunday give enough time for, I mean, does anyone ever show up for visitation and not be able to see their person? Are yes. They scheduled? Yes. Like if, if they show up late, uh, then obviously we don't allow them in. Uh, if we have, and I will tell you very, because of the amount of visitation hours that we have, we do not routinely uh, hit that max number that we're allowed to have in there. But if we do, then what we'll do is at a, at a period of time, the first person in would be, ultimately that's where we would start and say, we'll have to end your visitation a little early to allow the next visitor to come in. You may not get the full amount of time, but you're gonna get some time to visit with your, your family member if you've traveled that way. What is time allotment for visitation? It's uh, three hours per inmate which is actually uh, higher than what the size of the state is, two hours. Any other questions? Yes, sir. It's kind of like a communist question as well. As a former student of mine who unfortunately is in a federal prison in Illinois for bank robbery, and I correspond with him, it's interesting because if I mail him a letter, I can use a stamp, but I can't use any kind of return address sticker. The letter it will be sent back at any kind, like if I put an I love you sticker on the back or a happy Valentine's Day, but even a return address sticker is not allowed to send the letter back to me. So anyway, he's explaining all this to me because I have one of my letters returned. He said, don't put any kind of sticker on there. But what interesting comment he made, what will leave my question is, he said that at the prison, now this is a federal prison in Illinois, that the men barter in stamps. They don't have any kind of system. And yeah. so they, they buy stamps and they use that to like, if you do me a favor, I'll give you 10 of my stamps and stuff. Is that true? They do, and they, they'll use anything. You know, there's not, no inmate should have uh, U.S. currency on their person. Uh, so, but they'll use anything, whether it's honey bones off the commissary, a bag of chips, they'll, they'll use those things. Now, it's something obviously we don't condone, and if they, they're caught, it's a rule violation that we can hold them accountable for. But I'll tell you, the biggest issue with stamps inside the facility, I mean, all of is unfortunately, uh, people like to put contraband on the back of the stamps. Uh, and when I'm saying that, well, it's usually soaked or laced in some type of illegal substance, uh, whether they soak paper, whether, and we actually have some really, uh, high-tech type of equipment at the facility where we scan all mail. Many agencies are going away from the inmates getting hard mail altogether, uh, where they're getting actual set up kiosks where they can receive emails, as opposed to the, the mail coming in, because mail coming in is a threat of contraband. It's a threat to the staff who are having to search and go through that. Where there's been many uh, people across the country who've been exposed to fentanyl and various other uh, types of drugs, unfortunately, that have been tried to come through the U.S. mail uh, system. So there's there's the threat behind that as well. I know some some uh, county jails that I've seen have actually gone to postcards only. So you have to put all your information right on a postcard. There's no return there, and it's a little bit easier to search there. Yes, ma'am. Why can't it be required for incoming mail <coughs> that it's actually encoded with a stamp in the post office? You, That's you, the only thing that you will allow in the, in the 
you can't, and what we typically do is tear off. You're not gonna get your stamp, but there's a stamp on it. It's gonna be tore off before you got that, you get that envelope or sent to you. We're not gonna allow stamps to go back, but there's a lot of other parameters that, you know, you don't have to worry about Polaroids so much anymore, but you know, those used to be a big uh, source of uh, contraband coming inside of facilities as well. Um, but yeah, so we, we, we screen, I won't say we read, because we absolutely couldn't read every piece of mail that comes through, but we screen every, uh, document coming in, coming out of the facility, to try to lessen those opportunities. But more and more, you're seeing away, going away from the letters, going to the offender altogether, and going to emails. So, did you have a question? Now you talk about wanting to get them out, and not bring them, not coming back. And I see Sheriff Russell here, and I, I think here at the jail that we have people that are in the jail, they get out, and they want to go back because it puts a roof over their head. And, and food, similar deal for you? It, I, yes and no, probably not so much, and I've ran county jails in addition to, so I know the pain that the sheriff goes through, because you see that quite, especially as it gets cold, uh, people want a little more uh, security to be warm, but uh, I, I will say it happens, unfortunately, but usually when they come to me, they've committed so many of those low-level crimes, that they become repetitive, and so therefore they've met enough points to qualify for prison. But I would say the county jail, I don't know about the county jail here if that's a uh, regular problem, but the county jails I've ran, I've had that issue. Two thirds of the people we have here, I don't even know. Wow. So that tells you they're outside people that are committing crimes who are here in Trousdale County for the most part. Yes, ma'am, you had a question? Yes, I did. What is the process or the procedure when you release an inmate after they have served their time? If they do not have family to come pick them up, we we, uh, we we get them a bus ticket and we uh, ultimately to wherever their destination is their family one of my staff will physically take them to the bus station uh, so that they can catch that bus to get to their their destination so they're not just released out the door no ma'am there's no ma'am there's no fender that's gonna be walking from Trousdale now I can't tell you that they didn't get in somebody's vehicle that picked them up and then they get to the end of the road and turn loose but it, they, one of two ways have to be for their release. They have to have a family pickup there at the institution, or it's on. They're on a bus going to a, a destination that uh, the, they provided to us. Yes. You're talking about the mail. If they're not allowed to have any uh, money on them, they're not allowed to have stamps. How are they? How does someone send out a letter? They they can purchase stamps through the commissary. Uh, and, and actually, the, the pre-stamped envelopes that you were talking about—that's what we went to, even within our commissary, so that the offenders don't try to just and pass them back and forth to each other. So they can buy pre-stamped envelopes uh, that are embedded actually on the envelope that's not an actual stamp. But uh, we have a, a, a trust account for every offender, much like their bank account. So they'll get money sent into the facility; it'll be put onto their account. And so, same thing with medical. Anything that. Uh, that they're responsible for paying for. There's some medical services that they're responsible for paying for. Uh, not everything is free in prison as much as uh, people have a tendency to think that's the case. It's not, and we are trying to recoup as many of those dollars as we can. But there's, the inmate doesn't keep money on their person. Yes, ma'am. What's the percentage of the high-end crimes in there, too? You know, I'm not sure how to support it. Like I think murder what you're to robbery. Yeah, you're, I mean, the high violent type crimes. Yes. My, my population, I would say, is probably about 75% that are high violent type of offenders. So they'll never get out. I, I won't say that. Most, most of mine are, are eligible for parole. But there's a difference. You can have a person who's there on a murder charge who's done everything that they're supposed to have done while they're incarcerated and be a low custody inmate. Now, they're not going to go outside the fence and work but they're a low custody by classification. You can have a guy that's got a two year sentence who's been violent and committed multiple violations while incarcerated, who is a medium custody or higher custody inmate. So it's not necessarily just a factor of their current charge. It's all of their charges in the last 10 years, what type of crimes those are, uh, what is their conduct while they're there, do they have a uh, education as far as high school diploma or equivalency or greater, uh, what is their age? Do they, are they live local? There's a lot of factors that go into to determine a person's classification level. So, but as far as violent offenders, about 75% of my population would, would meet criteria to be classified as a violent offender. And, and I, I'm not mad at the state because if the roles are reversed and they gave me an opportunity to just say, Warden, there's no parameters. You just send me 500 of your inmates. I promise you I'm gonna go figure out 500 of the worst inmates that I have and send them as a, and package up in a little bow and say, here's your gift. 
Uh, and so we can't be mad at the state because what do you think we're going to get? We're the contracted agency. Uh, we know that we're going to get those offenders uh, who are a little more problematic. Uh, and so now the state does have some abilities for me to deny, and I do exercise that if there's an immediate threat to either the staff or the facility, we'll deny them and they'll ship them to a different facility. But that's, that's usually far in between. Yes. When uh, they were originally starting the prison, uh, we were told as uh, citizens of the county that this would not be a maximum security prison. It's not. It is a minimum, it's a low minimum and medium custody facility by classification. But, but I will tell you, um, we utilize the state's classification protocols. Whether I agree or disagree with the state's classification protocols, they're different than core civics, but we're obligated by contract to follow their classification system. So by their classification, they're a low or medium grade facility. Now you may take them to the state of Georgia, for example, take that same inmate who scores medium in the state of Tennessee, and he may be a close custody inmate in the state of Georgia. There's variances of how you get to that classification level. So as far as the facility, now I have at any given day, I have about 100 close custody inmates at that facility, although by contract and by policy, I'm not authorized to house them. And the reason for that is because there's not enough close custody beds in the state of Tennessee for those offenders to go. So they spend uh, their time in segregation uh, waiting a bed in a state facility that allows uh, close custody inmates to be housed there. Okay, I saw that on that close, and I did not know what it meant. That, it yeah, closed. close custody, and that's what that is. And so they don't walk my population. They don't go to the chows. They don't go to school. They stay in a cell 23-1 until they get transferred. And that's not healthy for the offender either. It's not, it's not a mental health side, it's not a good thing. So the state has got to come up with a system to create more beds across the state for close custody. It's not unique to Trousdale. Every one of their facilities have close custody inmates in their segregation beds waiting for a bed that can go to a close custody facility. So that's the same as solitary. Well, solitary is no longer allowed as a language, but, uh, but that's our segregation, yes ma'am. Right, and, and so that process, so that you understand, we have what we call cuff ports in the door and so anytime that offender comes outside of that cell whether it's to go to the shower whether it's to go to the recreation yard whether it's to go to medical that offender has to be put in handcuffs and double escorted uh, so they restrain them before they open the door two staff members present they open the door they physically take custody of that offender they escort them to their destination then they bring them back and then they reverse the process uh, so that offender is never outside of the cell without hard restraints on so, and again, that's just no way to house a person. I've got close custody inmates. I've been in that setting for over a year. Yeah. Is there a term limit for those particular inmates? I wish. To be there? Uh, you talking about the close custody? Mm -hmm. There is not. It's only availability. It's supposed to be beds. temporary. Yeah, it is supposed to be temporary. Uh, and it's, it's availability of beds. And it's not um, unknown to the commissioner. The commissioner knows it's a problem. Uh, the last meeting that I had is that they, they, the answer I got was that they didn't have a plan. So I'm not sure uh, if I would have stood publicly in front of a, a group of folks to say, we know there's a problem, but we don't have a plan. But that was that was what was communicated. Yes, ma'am? Well, this is not a question so much as okay. a comment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's truly a learning experience to tour the facility. But the thing that fascinated me most about how complex it is, is what I call your Jenga board. Oh, yeah. So if you could just explain right, a little bit. About the, the or you know how you have to balance yeah. This the gang people and the Yeah, we have three she's talking about our count room. If you go into our count room, we've got large uh, magnetic boards that's got uh, uh, it's kind of an antiquated process, but it shows us the housing uh, that the inmate uh, is assigned to. It also shows what uh, STG affiliation, which is their gang affiliation that they may have. There's also the PREA, which is Prison Rape Elimination Act. You have to uh, assess an offender, determine whether he's a victim, potential victim. Uh, predator or potential predator and you can't house predators with uh, victims or potential victims so that's one of the things that staff have to know you can't house certain gang members that rival gang members in the same cell with each other otherwise you're gonna have problems you can't put a bunch of the same gang all in the same location because then they're going to start trying to empower put power exercise power over the other offenders that are not gang affiliated inside of there uh, and then you have to add in all the other factors that go in there, medical grade, classification levels, all those things go into to play. So it's not simple, I can move an offender from this area to this area uh, without a lot of red tape and having to go through that and making sure that we're making the right decisions. But 
we, we manage that all on the board. We have the TDOC system and then we have four civic systems. So uh, those count room staff should look like me, ball headed, uh, because they have to go through a lot of stuff just to house or move an inmate inside the facility. Any other questions? How do those gang members communicate? Oh, yeah. you, you would be surprised. Yeah, you would be surprised. Uh, cell phones is a big, big avenue, and of course, no, we don't authorize cell phones. And quite frankly, I wish I knew what service they were using because mine doesn't work at the prison, uh, or it's, it's very sparse. But uh, I think they're still used a lot of times the analog uh, type of connectivity versus the digital, which is different. Uh, but they'll use cell phones, they'll use encrypted uh, letters, they'll use uh, encrypted uh, hand signals, uh, just talking to one another. Uh, so you know, I'll give you an example of how, how much of a threat a cell phone is inside of a correctional facility. This is where we have to uh, nationally get strong, take a stronger stance of making these items uh, a criminal offense to possess inside of a correctional facility. There's been correctional officers killed in the line of duty and then backtrack to find out that it was uh, planned and orchestrated over cell phones. Because we can't govern those, so we don't know. All of our phones are recorded, and that we've got alert things in there. So if a person says escape, or they say murder, they say it's gonna flag that call, and the investigator is gonna know that, hey, you need to go listen to that particular call. You don't have that with a cell phone. And so they can orchestrate plans, and so we hear this a lot where, you know, the phone's charged, it's a collect call, so the family members are going to accept these collect calls from offenders. You come into the facility, and, and I'm a vice lord, and I say to you, hey, don't use that expensive phone. Why don't you use my cell phone? Because I'm a good guy. And then you use my cell phone, and you call all of your family members, and then what are you going to do with that phone? You're going to give it back to me. And when you give it back to me, what did you just give me? All of your family's telephone numbers. So now I'm going to call your family and say, I'm going to hurt little Johnny, or I'm going to kill little Johnny, unless you introduce contraband into this facility that we can come to visit. So they are a huge extortion uh, ability for utilizing their cell phones on top of a security threat. But as of today, it is not a criminal violation for an offender to possess a cell phone inside of a correctional facility. So those are things some states have taken that position. I can't use jammers. There's FCC regulations that prohibit me from putting jammers inside of the correctional facility that would render a cell phone a paperweight uh, because there's a lot of lobbyists and things of that nature out there on the cell phone side of the house because it's a big money market for them to be able to sell these burner phones, send them inside of the facility, and then ultimately get used. So uh, until we get an opportunity and laws change to make those things a paperweight, that, that's the, probably the number one threat to any institution is a cell phone. Yes, sir? I see the bus every few days come through. What kind of turnover do you have? Are they coming and going at the same time, basically? Typically, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays are our chain days. It's days that we send inmates out to uh, various other facilities and days uh, the days in which we receive offenders back into the facility. Now, we do take special chains on occasion, especially if it's trying to keep those beds filled so that we can get the county jails empty, and that's been a... So we've seen a little more influx of those buses going in and out, uh, but our scheduled days are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of every week. So one of the other things too, it's a state-of-the-art type of system that we have at the facility is a drone detection device, and I talked about this at the Prison Oversight Committee. We've had the drone detection device for a, a, about a year now, but we've recently, in the last four months, uh, upgraded the system. Before, it would just simply tell me that there's been a drone alert somewhere within a four-mile radius, uh, around the facility, um, but it wouldn't necessarily tell me where or how close to the prison it was. It was just somewhere within that three to four mile radius that it was uh, t uh, capturing. The new software not only allows me to, one, narrow uh, the, 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 the umbrella to where it's a little less than a mile around the facility, so we've seen a lot less uh, kids playing with their drones or people playing with their drone alert type things, and I can also see the flight path and I can also kind of pinpoint the originator, where that person uh, is at that is flying that particular drone. And, and that's important for us because now that uh, we've uh, strengthened our fences and we've taken away some ability for people to come try to throw stuff over the fence, they're utilizing drones now to try to come over the facility to drop contraband inside of the facility so that the offenders can access it that way. So 
Uh, that's a really, uh, it was about a $30,000 system upgrade, but in the same token, it was well worth it. I, I actually brought this up a few, of the, a few quarters ago at Prison Night Civil Society Committee, and so one person said, because I said, hey, every Sunday at noon, it was like clockwork, I was getting alerts, and then we could never find the person, and the person behind me said, oh, sorry, that was probably me, because I fly every Sunday near the prison, so. Um, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, it's a good system, and it's a state-of-the-art system, and it's helping uh, protect the staff and the facility. I guess I watch too much television, but if that drone does get too close, y'all shoot him down? I wish, but, there's, but believe it or not, there's actually regulations that I can't do that. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on TV, yeah, yeah, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I might have one small answer. <laughs> hey, any answer is not a small answer to me. <laughs> Just the most complicated thing. I went online, remember this? I tried to bring my hands with the core civic. Yeah. I even drove out there to talk to human resources. I never had any results. Here's so you did you apply online? I tried online with your core civic. I even came out to the facility and talked to HR as well. You need to go to this website. I said, well, I, I tried this. I tried this. Uh, well, if you'll see me after, we'll see if we can uh, streamline that. Because if you're having that problem, there may be others having that same problem as well. I have to say they have to, the, the, the big thing to be mindful of is when you go on there, you have to select Trousdale because we have facilities all across the United States. And then you have to look, to, and that should show you what positions are uh, available. I was actually looking at a teaching position. I need teachers, so I definitely want to see you after. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm not sure if you can answer this. How many actual inmates do you house, or can you house? Yes, ma'am. We, we can, uh, bed capacity is 2,672. Where our contracted capacity is 2,552, our average is about 2,500. So, on uh, any given day, there's 2,500 plus uh, offenders that are at Trousdale. And we are the largest facility in the state of Tennessee. Wow. Yep. And by the way, we are the highest paid uh, correctional <laughs> officers in the state of Tennessee as well. Yes, and then it's not enough, I can assure you. So, it looks like she's up here, so that means I'm running out of time. <laughs> so, um, any other questions? Or? Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to go ahead and drop the door prize. Um, we'll let Jerry draw because it's not going to win today. <laughs> I've got one of those books. I'd like to have another one. Can we do this? Yeah. Last three numbers. This is for the movie tickets from WTNK. Five, six, seven.